Devastating images have been coming from both Turkey as well as Syria, the two countries that are battling one of the worst earthquakes in the last hundred years. Situation continues to be grim as the death toll continues to mount in both the countries and rescue operations are on. Field teams and uh, specialists from across the world are flying into Turkey and Syria to salvage of what is actually left in the debris, images of children being taken out of there are just heart-wrenching. But I want to bring in Dr. Kit Miyamoto, who is the CEO of Miyamoto International, as well as a structural engineer and disaster management expert. Uh, with me at the moment, uh, Miyamoto International is uh, also in collaboration with the the India-led uh, Collision for Disaster Resilience Infrastructure. Uh, Dr. Kit, thank you so much for your time because I know you. that uh, your teams are also involved in uh, rescue operations in Turkey as we speak. What is your assessment of the situation there? Because the president has said that perhaps, uh, you know, they have taken much time to actually rescue people. And what is your assessment of the ground situation? Well, as you can see from the images from the news, uh, this is uh, probably this is a big disaster, and probably probably become the biggest disaster in this decade, affecting almost a hundred kilometers long of the fault line ruptured, and um, uh, affecting uh, over ten to twenty million people. That's a, uh, it's one eighth of a country affected by that, and um, you you're talking about is that this is. Uh, you're going to see that the death toll going to rise. Right now, it's around 7,000. And um, eventually, you're going to see go up to USGS forecast around 30 to 40,000 people death. You're going to see something like that, which means the uh, usual injury factor is times five. So you're going to see about 200,000 uh, injured people. And uh, building context, uh, context, you're talking about it's 10 provinces, by the way, affecting that. Yes. And, um, uh, right now, estimation is about 10,000 buildings may be totally collapsed, which means usually times 10. So if a 10,000 buildings collapsed, you're going to see that somewhere between the 50,000 to 100,000 buildings are uh, damaged and cannot be occupied. Hmm. So it's a big earthquake. And uh, Turkey, Turkish government and the people has been preparing for this type of event, by the way. Uh, because since 1999 earthquake they had, uh, they're very serious about this risk management. And they're preparing for, especially for Istanbul, uh, a city of 20 million people, they're, pre they're preparing for the Istanbul earthquake, actually. So uh, they do have a very robust engine capacity and uh, emergency response capacity they do have there. But however, this is a big earthquake and affecting a huge area in a very remote area too, in a mountainous area. So I can see that definitely one country, one government cannot cope with that. That's why that international support is really critical for both the expertise and uh, money, everything about it. And robust as the Turkish government is, I think it's critical. Well, uh, Dr. Kidd, it's absolutely horrific to hear that uh, perhaps the death toll that is being reported currently is also uh, going to keep rising steadily. And uh, the impact and the magnitude that the earthquake has had on all these 10 cities uh, within Turkey is huge. It's humongous. Uh, but uh, you did mention that, uh, you know, the Turkey and the Turkish government was preparing for something like that, perhaps in Istanbul and Ankara, which are uh, more uh, yeah. cosmopolitan in metropolitan cities, but where this has happened in the province in Giantep, uh, there it seems like rescue operations uh, are moving at a snail pace. We've heard from the government officials that they don't have uh, uh, moving machines, they don't have earth movers, they don't have uh, uh, ambulances that can enter the area. It's a very grim situation. It's a really difficult, and uh, not only the uh, uh, buildings damage, but the uh, infrastructure, roads, and the bridges, especially in the mountains. And so reach to, to the at uh, location itself is actually a uh, struggle to get there. So yeah, it is true. The, uh, this area last earthquake was uh, over a hundred years ago. So it's definitely the, uh, uh, you know, it's always like that, right? And always something unexpected happens. Like for example, in Japan, Kobe earthquake we saw in the early 1990s, we didn't expect mm -hmm. the Kobe earthquake happens there. You know, and Northridge earthquake, we never thought about Northridge gonna have a, 
uh, earthquake there. So it's a, it's a definitely the, the always like that, you know, when unexpected, that's always happened that way, it seems. But uh, mm-hmm. it's definitely the, uh, uh, yeah, Istanbul is one thing, but it's a, it's a completely different area. It's in a, you know, southern border to Syria. It's a very remote area. And yes. um, uh, there's also that the smaller villages, towns too, which I don't think no one ever been reached there, those places yet. And uh, I, I'm afraid that uh, uh, fatalities will increase because of that. Well, uh, what is going to be your role in the entire disaster management over there? Uh, how are you going yeah. to make sure, because you mentioned that there are about 10,000 buildings that have collapsed because of yeah. the high magnitude of the earthquake. And besides mm-hmm. that, you've mentioned about 30,000 such buildings uh, are uh, are not being used by people to live in. Perhaps people are scared. They don't want to live in high rises for the moment. Mm-hmm. I also probably damaged structures that you're going to see it up to 100, maybe over 100,000 buildings, probably. You're going to see something like that. And uh, yes. yes, and uh, people don't want to live in a, you know, in a concrete buildings right now, uh, as we speak. Mm-hmm. And also the uh, aftershocks is large, you know, and it's going to be keep going to, to fairly frequently, frequently to all the way to six months. And it will kind of decay after that. But sometimes you're going to see the aftershocks even bigger than that, you know, first one too. So we just got to be kind of careful about it. But uh, um, I think... Um, so I think for our role is uh, could, it's a uh, here's what uh, we are right. So our Turkish team uh, we have a um, operation in Istanbul. Uh, so that mm. team is on the ground right now, and mm. they are supporting that the, both the Turkish government and also private sector with Turkey mm-hmm. for the assessments mm. and so on. And uh, I'll be coordinate. I'll be there uh, uh, Thursday night. And uh, I'll be coordinating with the uh, both uh, uh, obviously government, local governments, and also the um, uh, World Bank and uh, other international agencies to basically see the, the what is the um, gaps that potentially that required, you know. Um, but usually when we're there, you we get into the like, you know, we get pulled in, right? People need some help, you know. People yes. need uh, see the cracks. See what 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 what's going on? Is that safe to occupy? So we we really get pulled in by just just the people, you know, to the mm. communities. You know, initially that's going to be always the case like that, and we just kind of say no, we're going to help them, you know. Mm. And uh, you know, we are earthquake structure engineers. We've been doing this for so long. This is exactly what we do for a living. This is what we do, you know. So yes. And uh, I also want to know from you uh, the number of buildings that have collapsed. Interestingly, I also heard that uh, these buildings, were they uh, following some kind of a building code or uh, following some kind of an infrastructural code? What has actually led to the collapse of so many buildings? Was the earthquake uh, enough to have shaken the structural uh, boundaries or bonds of these uh, structures? So... Turkish building code has a drastic change happened in 1997. So that particular code changed the, uh, uh, how actually the building code addresses seismic issues. So after like 1997, if it's for the code, the building should be pretty safe. But anything before that, it's dangerous. Like, for example, most of the countries like the mid 1980s, you see, that's where the, the code change is drastically. You know, hmm. so all the stucco buildings, it's you, especially concrete structures, it's a very, very dangerous. And this is something that the uh, building types are very similar to the India, what you see out there, a lot of the concrete structures and a lot of the, the brick uh, uh, structures, you know, you see in uh, India is very similar to what you see in uh, Turkey. Now, so building code is the one issue, right? So in the building code evolves all the time. So current Turkish building code is good as any building code. You know, it's, it's, okay. it's, it's a good code. But code is one thing. But engineering has to be good too, right? And engineering has to adapt the code and uh, put a design to it. And Turkish engineers are very good engineers and they obviously do that. But now, most important part of it, how the contractors implement the design. That's the gap there. That's a gap that we see everywhere. Not only Turkey, all over the place in the whole world. Doesn't matter have a great code, great design, but if it's not done right on the field, it kill people. 
And that's what you see out there. So many buildings collapse out there. It's so obviously all the buildings, but also the, the, our team reporting that one out of 10 buildings they see out there, there was a fairly new construction is actually collapsing because implementation was not quite right. Now, if you follow the building code, the latest building code, let's say India uh, building code or any other code, even California code, hmm. expectation is you design and you build correctly. If the large earthquake happens, it will shake a lot still. And if it doesn't follow the code, it could collapse. But if you follow the code, hopefully it stay like this. So it doesn't, mm -hmm. so it doesn't kill people. So that's actually intent of a building code. In building code is meant to be reduction of the risk of death and injury, life safety code. That's all we call. So that's why that actually, you know, seismically risky area, it's important to apply the no use the building code as like a minimum guideline. You have to do a little bit more than that. You know, that's something that uh, I see quite often, even place like a Kathmandu, as you know, the mm -hmm. Nepal experienced a large earthquake in uh, 2015. And um, um, after that, it's very actively uh, doing that the right construction. For example, one of projects in the Hilton, it's a high rise Hilton uh, projects in uh, uh, downtown Kathmandu, uh, we actually use some the seismic damping devices into the system because that's the, the owners want to do much more than building code, you know? So I think mm -hmm. that kind of a, you know, thought process to, to meet people to understand that what does this mean? You know, what is the order building means? Then what is the uh, current engineering is? And uh, what is building code? How can you make it better? I think that's really critical. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, the earthquake that happened in Nepal, uh, you know, which brought down several houses in Kathmandu as well. That was in 2015. Yeah. Uh, but uh, having said that, you've also covered uh, disaster management and risk assessment you've done in Haiti and other areas as well. How do you see the current uh, tragedy that's unfolding in Turkey and Syria when you compare these with the earthquakes that have happened previously? Same. I mean, that, uh, you're not going to see any new discovery of this uh, building failure modes or anything like that. It's a, such a tragic. We keep learning the same lessons over and over and over and again. It's just that the older concrete structures is very dangerous. And uh, if you don't follow the building code, it's dangerous. If it's not implemented, it's very dangerous. It's like the same lesson, you know? And, uh, but what frustrates frustrate me the most is the actually means to address this. For example, that older concrete or concrete or brick structures, you can just seismically strengthen it. And the usual cost is somewhere between five to 5% 5 to 15% what total construction cost. So very you know, small investment, you can make the building much safer. So things like that, something that uh, it seems uh, public don't quite know that yet. I think that would be something good to really talk about that. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, it's definitely the, uh, such a such a huge tragic out there, you know. It's a whole horrible, and uh, and uh, but uh, it doesn't have to be that way, you know. It really doesn't. But unfortunately, you know, when countries don't really understand the impacts that earthquakes could have, and as we speak, uh, Doctor Kit, we understand that uh, in this in the last few years there has been a rise in the number of earthquakes, not just in. Uh, seismic zones that are earthquake prone, but in other areas as well. What is leading to uh, this rise in the number of earthquakes that we are experiencing currently? If you could throw some light on that. Well, I mean, there are many theories out there, but uh, to me, like earthquake risk or earthquake hazard is always there, continually, consistently there. But I think where we live is different. Used to be, we may live in. Um, what I call it, housings, you know, small houses, which been adapted over the centuries. So maybe people are gonna die from those events. But now we built in the high rise buildings, high density, you know, dangerous area, especially, I think a lot to do with the population uh, increase in the density. So, so the earthquake uh, hazard may be consistent, but we are adding the more risk to it because of where we live. You know, the, how many people live in there and the bigger the building yeah. is. And also many buildings are built so rapidly, right? Without no consideration of safety, that causes a high risk, the high depth. That's what you're seeing out there. And uh, 
So, uh, like, you know, come to India, it's the same thing. You know, we're going to see the very similar kind of things you know, happen in uh, Nepal or Turkey. And, uh, mm. but it's just not, it's just not too late, you know. That's why that I think uh, uh, agency like a CDRI, the Coalition Disaster, you know, Infrastructure uh, uh, Reduction, I mean, this organization a CDRI, it could mm. have a huge impact actually, and both uh, internationally and domestically. And this is an Indian-led organization, you know? And uh, India has a, such a huge capacity. And I think that uh, India can share a lot from, uh, from that within to the all over the world to really change that. And also India, this factor too, you know? So I do believe India can be truly a leader. No, of course, uh, Dr. Kid, India it has been one of the first mover countries uh, to move assistance and supplies to Turkey as yeah. well as Syria. Uh, no That's doubt right. about that. Uh, but uh, also, lastly, I just want to ask you, you mentioned that a lot of people might be scared to live inside buildings now and high-rise structures. Uh, how is your team going to make sure that uh, they are uh, accommodated because the temperatures uh, I hear are sub-zero. It's freezing out there. And uh, the kind of power cuts, uh, lack of electricity, uh, also after the earthquake has exasperated the entire situation. How are you going to ensure that these people are now in homes and safe? Well, I mean, that, uh, for our team is concerned, we, uh, you know, we assess the place we stay beforehand. And usually we stay in a very small Small place, no windows. Okay, <laughs> so it's you know okay. a little safer maybe. And mm -hmm. uh, my case, I just bring a sleeping bag, you know, and um, just a you know, filter, uh, water filter, you know, and uh, that kind of thing. So you you, you know it, it, that's if if we need to use it, that's what we do things. And yes. um, it's because we don't want to impact what's going on out there, right? And um, but I think. Uh, I think what, what's going on here right now is a tremendous amount of uh, uh, so-called people who lost homes, right? And uh, you're talking about 10,000 buildings. You're talking about maybe 100,000 buildings being damaged. And you're talking about affecting a you know, couple million people probably. So, so it's, a, it's a big issue. And, um, but however, where the Turkey works though, uh, they do have extended families in different places. So they try to go to place like that, you know? But uh, yeah. even so, I think the, uh, uh, the what we call IDP, the internal displacement, displaced people, you know, issues is definitely there. And especially at the, you know, really cold out there, you know. Yeah. So that's something that uh, we will see, we will see that how we can support it. This, this is what we call shelter, you know, components of this disaster. And uh, right now, United Nations not activated yet in the area. Turkish government is taking the, taking the lead. But uh, you and the system do have the capacity. Excuse me. I mean, bless you. And absolutely, that is very, very concerning, the information that you have given us. And uh, I want to wish you all the best. And bless you again. Uh, do take care. But uh, it's uh, absolutely horrific. I yeah, understand. It's I absolutely horrific, the images that have been coming out. And uh, thanks to countries. I like India and companies uh, such as yourself that you are working to help the people in need and in crisis in Turkey yeah. as well as Syria and one of the deadly earthquakes it has seen in the last 100 years. Thank you, Dr. Yes. Kit, for speaking to us at India today. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.